Welcome to Brain and Event. We are delighted to be joined by Hans Gudbrot, and we're going to be talking about political commemoration. Hans, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yes, I have a thought experiment or more a scenario. And I think it might be a scenario that's familiar to, to maybe many of your listeners. And imagine you're at a family gathering. And in the family gathering, people ask you, what have you recently been up to? And as I assume quite a few uh, situations that many of your listeners are in, that they, they will say something, I've recently been kind of into philosophy, you know, I've been reading books in philosophy. And then the next thing that might happen is that your aunt says, so philosophy? So, you know, what, what is that really good for? These are really dark times, she might say. These are times when we're under threat. Democracies seem to be under threat. So what can you actually offer? You have all of these theories. And then maybe because she, she really wants to go for you or, or kind of challenge you in maybe a good way, she's going to say, so I understand that philosophy has all these theories on democracy, et cetera. But what about these issues about the past? These issues that seem to divide many democracies, the street names, the statues, how we look at museums, and she's going to ask you, so what, what can you as philosopher or as a person interested in philosophy, what can you offer? And at that point, I think so far, at least in, in, in my senses, I mean, people might kind of go a little bit, uh, well, you know, Emmanuel Levinas, the other kind of maybe Immanuel Kant kind of categorical comparative but there seems to me, really, the scenario seems to me to highlight that there's been a gap in philosophy, that while we've had good theories about kind of a representation on the present, while well, we've had thinking about the future, when it comes to political uses of the past, my senses and my claim is, is that the debate, so to speak, has been pretty inchoate, as Isaiah Berlin would put it, that it's been pretty fragmented. And that's the scenario that I start from, and that's the kind of scenario or the gap that 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 I'm trying to that that I think is worth addressing from a point of view of ethics. And by the way, if I've missed something, of course, if some listeners want to point out to me that there's something really, really totally essential that I've missed, of course, I'd love to hear about it. But I do think that there's a big gap. So, do you think the gap is? You mentioned the word ethics. So, is the gap around the ethics of? of representations of the past, so statues and paintings and museums, um, about whether they're right or wrong to have, whether they're right or wrong to tear down. Um, so is the question around the ethics of it, or do you think there's also other gaps like the metaphysics of these things? There's In philosophy, there has been discussion around um, what is what is what makes a statue a statue instead of just a lump of clay, for example. You know, do you feel like there's gaps also around the metaphysics, or is this an ethical issue primarily that you're looking at? Uh, my sense is that the huge gaps uh, is in gap is in ethics, and in metaphysics we have because there's metaphysics of art, there is uh, questions of representation and mimesis, so to speak, and even the kind of Platonic cave, what what is real, what is not real. So we have discussed this question, and the gap in ethics I think arises from a particular confluence, so that. Um, typically, these questions were of how we deal with the past have been looked at within the discipline of history, but the discipline of history is not so much concerned with ordering public debates. And the other thing that's really influenced uh, the debates is, is itself comes from a philosophical tradition, which is a kind of genealogical account that kind of is rooted in in, in a kind of Nietzschean approach to moral inquiry, or rather doubt about moral inquiry, where you kind of trace how particular uses of the past or uses of, of public claims, how they're really an expression of will to power. But that's fundamentally distrustful of ethics. And so I think between those these sets of concerns, there simply hasn't been very systematic attention. And, and I think it's to everyone's loss because you could actually demonstrate to your aunt and that, uh, that ethics has a lot to offer. So it seems like one way that you could assess um, living statues memorials is to look at the effect that they have on uh, the public at large at the time. So you could say that uh, 
people venerate a particular historical figure that they see themselves as connected to this figure. So you can imagine, for example, a statue of Winston Churchill in London. Um, Churchill seen as, uh, you know, an important figure in British history who helped uh, vanquish the Nazis. Um, and you could then have a change in perception of that figure. So recently there have been attacks on uh, Churchill's statue. It's had to be protected on the grounds that uh, Churchill was in favor of British colonialism um, and he's seen as an imperialist figure. And so one way of determining whether you keep the thing up is to uh, count up the amount of offense that people feel. Um, and this could fluctuate over time. Maybe you have some sort of threshold level where you say once it reaches this level of offense, well, then we have a reason to remove the statue. And of course, we know that many statues have been removed in recent years. Uh, um, in South Africa, for example, there's a famous statue of Cecil John Rhodes uh, that was taken down by students at the University of Cape Town. Uh, America seems to have uh, followed in its stead by taking down you know, statues of uh, various um, um, members of the, uh, of the Civil War. Um, uh, I think there's even a call for statue of Lincoln to be taken down on the grounds that it was uh, it's him emancipating the slaves. It was seen as a, um, a racist statue. Um, so that is something like one framework that philosophers will give you, which is you count the levels of offense. Um, I wonder if you think that's a good framework um, and uh, if you think that there are alternative frameworks we could look at. Yeah, I think the, the the sensible framework, from my point of view, is a kind of ethics of political commemoration. And that's that leans up and is derived from just war theory. And that at first seems a little counterintuitive. But just war theory, if you think about it, is a multidimensional framework that's developed over a very long time, where we look at, at the very extreme of a political contest, uh, one in which there's no external arbiter. And often what is at stake in these questions of commemoration within societies with statues or street names or museums are also versions of political contest where in the sense of what do we take to be the, the public standards are also getting defined through that contest. And so when you think about the multidimensionality of it uh, that you have in, in the just war theory and specifically in use at bellum. So primarily the, the considerations about whether it's justified to go uh, to, to, to compel others with force. Then we have multiple criteria that people typically consider. And as you've had in previous discussions, we have a just cause. And so we often think about pretty, something pretty similar with statues that should have to be a just cause. But we also have the question about what's the right intention? What is the intention that's there? And one historian has put it this way, uh, Jay Winter has said, it's not so much the act of commemoration that's problematic, it's the intent with which some of the motive that sometimes uh, is kind of mobilized within that. And so then the next consideration is also one of, uh, or another consideration under the just war criteria is the idea of legitimate authority. Now, in the past, legitimate authority primarily meant authority, the ability you should be able to stop it. So there was, those were the concerns we had in antiquity, kind of fear of a kind of state of nature, um, a, hard, a, a war that would be hard to stop. Now, I think that's migrated with more of an emphasis to le legitimacy. And therein lies one of the key components, I think, in, in, in contemporary debates as well, that these debates themselves are actually important because they generate a degree of legitimacy. So there's a broader, there's one more criterion that we think is appropriate under what, what I would call the kind of uh, uh, use at memoriam. Is it appropriate, like kind of leaning up against use, uh, use at bellum, is it appropriate to mobilize memory, and that would be the chance to we have reasonable chances of success. And once you have these four criteria, you end up actually having a much more nuanced, I think, and, and, and richer debate. And also a richer debate, by the way, to describe when commemoration goes well, because I think we've gotten used to a kind of, you know, the hooray theory of moral approval. We put a like uh, or a thumbs up under something, and that's just not really a very rich description. I mean, that's very interesting. So are you saying that similar criteria for when you can go to war could be used to show when you can put up a statue or when you should keep it up? Um, and I was just wondering 
about your fourth criterion, whether it will suffer from Mark's, Mark's concerns that he's already raised, appropriateness. So appropriateness, you cashed out as a reasonable chance at success. So when you say it's appropriate to keep a statue up um, or to erect a statue, that there's a reasonable chance at success. So you're saying there's a reasonable chance that that statue will fulfill its goal. Um, but appropriateness, I'm assuming, could also signify whether people feel that it's appropriate in the sense that it matches their sensibilities. And at that point, that's when you introduce um, a fence as a reason to take it down. Yeah, so so I think even the, what, what makes that framework so... Um, so rich in my view is that even that question of what what do you actually see as success for a society with regards to intent becomes relevant and so for example um I'll, I'll, one example is there's a quote from from an armenian who said on the occasion of the german bundestag the german parliament recognizing the armenian genocide saying uh, and this is the verbatim quote translated from german uh, say, only when all states will recognize uh, the genocide will we Armenians find peace. So that's a version of you know framing the past where you actually kind of don't necessarily have that much of a chance of success because you externalize control over how you conceive of peace to others. So that you know, goes beyond a particular statue. But let's take another example. Sarah Gensburg, uh, a French historian, has actually done empirical work where she says the claims that particular modes of memorialization lead to a decline of discriminatory behavior, of particular kinds of anti-Semitism and racism, that empirically it cannot be held up. Now, I'm not so much saying in one particular case of the statue, you know, this clearly points in this direction or this points in that direction. But what I am saying is those are questions that should actually be debated and should be considered. And one particular important point here is that this gives a very strong role to empirical, local, uh, social research that may be both quantitative and qualitative. So it actually gives a kind of strong ethical role to that. And it's also one that actually differs from the just war theory. In the just war theory, we're kind of doing a projection about, well, we think we have a chance of prevailing. Whereas in this particular case, you can test it out. Does a, say, reframe narrative about how you deal with uh, with the challenges of the past, how you deal with terrible things that have happened in the past. Does that actually put people at ease? Does it actually help us to transcend something or does it not do so? So again, it's not so much to, to, to push people in a particular direction, but to say here are, there are often claims of this will happen. There will be a causal effect. We will reduce offense. We will actually make people feel better. And I think this is a chance to consider, consider that under this heading. So I want to think about two cases. The one is a real case and the other one's imagined. The real case is the Mongolians erected a gigantic monument to Genghis Khan. And so I wonder how that works on your framework. In other words, Khan is certainly not someone who is engaged in a just war. This is someone who's engaged in like bloodthirsty conquest. Um, as you said, not legitimately put into power in a democratic process. So someone who, you know, takes power through might. Um, but the Mongolians right now are, you know, not exactly in the world's most prosperous nations. Um, and so might feel like, you know, this is a treasured war hero for us. This is someone, you know, who celebrates the prior history of Mongolia when we were once a great nation. So they feel it is very appropriate. And maybe even the bigger that's, that statue is and the more they talk about it, the more you convince people about the justness of the war. As you say, it has that, that rhetorical effect. Second one is this. Um, so I'm going to invent this scenario. Imagine that the British, after losing um, to the Americans in the War of Independence, erect a memorial to uh, the soldiers who died, all the British soldiers who died at the hands of the Americans. Now, imagine the Americans are going to say the War of Independence was a totally just war. We were under you know, the yoke of the king. We had to pay these unjust taxes. And you know, we have shown ourselves to be a nation full of liberty. Um, it's not clear that the British soldiers who died were the bad guys. Um, and they might have exhibited various acts of bravery uh, in that. Is there something bad about them having erected that statue or that memorial to the to the dead soldiers 
it's not clear what they're memorializing. It's not a victory over the Americans because they didn't have it, but it's to commemorate, let's say, the brave acts of those who died in this war. Yeah, I mean, these these are excellent questions. And I, I should say, how can I say, these frameworks are a little bit like a grammar. So they're, they're, they're very good to have around as a reference and to explain in particular how you how you look at more complex cases. But kind of the interesting thing is, so to speak, the poetry is it's the individual case. It's looking at that. And we have a second set of, or I say we, I've, I've worked with, with some colleagues also in developing this, uh, including people that worked a lot in conflict transformation, David Wood, uh, uh, a person that's worked a lot in Libya and Lebanon and knows how how difficult the past can be in, in, uh, in the present. And the second set of considerations is how actually do you do the, the memorializing and the commemoration? And this is a set of principle that, does tries to do something similar again as the, the use in bellow criterion, a kind of discrimination, a kind of uh, trying to limit uh, damage that you don't need to do. And there are a set of considerations there. So a couple of things that we typically look, that I think makes sense to look at there is, does it transform the collective? Does it actually, especially for example, for victims, does it uh, just repeat, so to speak, patterns of uh, of opposition or um, uh, of victims versus perpetrators, or does it open up? And a second the consideration there, I'm not going to go through all the four right now, but a second consideration is, does it exit circular narratives? And essentially, just putting something up that's big about the imperial past that wouldn't necessarily fully meet that kind of criterion. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, exit a circular narrative uh, because it just emphasizes a kind of regal past that has very little and royal or, or imperial past that has little relationship to the con contemporary moment. At the same time, it may actually succeed in, in other ways that it does actually get people, you know, it inspires people, it inspires people to consider that actually the country could also achieve something. And so it's meant to, as said, to have a differentiated description so that it isn't a single just thumbs up or thumbs down and to have these various nuances. And if you t talk about, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the fictional case of the British soldiers uh, and in the American War of Independence, but you can take the question about German war graves, for example, and already a question after the First World War. And that's very extensively in the literature and described there, how the Imperial War Graves Commission, for example, that, that had from the Commonwealth had a rather uplifting version, the White Crosses, Kipling being involved there, Rudyard Kipling, in the, I think, in, in, uh, in, in the War Graves Commission, his son, had, he had lost a son in the, in the war, compared to the German War Graves, which after the First World War already, and there's a little bit of the Treaty of Versailles, also plays a role, is much more solemn, is uh, much more throws the individual back into this consideration of utter loss. And so th that level of appropriateness is, I think, something to, co to consider there. And one criterion that we talk about that I think is also important is some, some, some somewhat clunky phrase where I talk about good memorials and good commemoration typically has what contained an unfathomability. And what I mean with that, we think, commemoration should be contained if it's absolutely everywhere, like martyr posters in Beirut, yeah, where constantly you're reminded of the past, then it may be too much. So it should be contained, but there's also something that should be unfathomable. So if it's just a ritual and the same thing over and over again, I don't think we'd, we'd consider it a particularly appropriate uh, or particularly powerful uh, way of commemoration. So I've got three objections. Um, two of them are related. So the first one is a scope problem. So you talk about political commemoration. So I assume that this account is meant to tell us about political social phenomena. So statues and maybe road names, street names, if they've got a political connection to the past. But of course, uh, political scientists will tell you everything's political. Um, so, you know, let's say you're commemorating a filmmaker, but it turns out that filmmaker held a certain political belief. You know, is it a political statue now or not? So there's a scope question. Um, the second, the second uh, problem I have is this might give you an answer about whether you should put up a statue, but I don't think it gives you an answer about whether you should take one down. 
The reason being that the answer is going to change over time. So you've got all these different factors that you're, that you're weighing, these four different factors, but those factors include empirical data about today's, today's populace, the people around them today. Of course, the people 10 years ago or 10 years from now are going to have, they get, when you, when you interview them and you ask, you know, what their reactions are and whether it's going to transform that populace, as you said, um, the answer could be different. So whether you tear down a particular statue now on this formula or on this account could give you a very different answer in five years or 10 years and 20 years. Um, and that's a problem because once you've torn down the statue, it's down. So, you know, I, I, how are you going to deal with that problem? And then a third problem, which is related to the second problem, is a problem of vagueness. So because you're dealing with multiple factors here, how do you weigh them against each other? You know, this is a problem that I've highlighted um, when, when we discuss any ethical topic with Mark, because Mark is a deontologist. He likes the idea of duties. He likes the idea of rights and um, obligations. And I always say to him, I can't, I can't sniff and taste and touch these obligations. I want a, sim a, simple, I want a simple formula, which is just utility in the case of ethics. And I'm not saying utility will do a better job than yours will. I'm sure there's going to be lots of problems, including the initial objection that Mark gave around offense. But the problem here is that there's vagueness. You know, utility gives you an answer. Here, it, it feels to me like not just the problem of over time, you know, over time, the answer is going to change. But even at one time, how are you going to weigh these four factors against each other? You know, how, how, how are you going to come up with a, a single answer, uh, put up the statue or don't? How, how do you arrive at a yes, no? Yeah, Jason, those are excellent points. And um, so the, in, in terms of, let me start with a, with a question of shifting. Uh, shifting uh, shifting views over time. What what I, we say early in the book is it's about conversations, not about courts. It's not a single final judgment that you'll have, but it's precisely uh, to to in order to improve the conversations so that ideally we don't entirely talk past each other. And if I may, one of the metaphors that I, that I that I think is a good one that kind of takes off on that or takes off from this diagnosis of fragmentation of moral discourse that we have in Alistair McIntyre. So a lot of moral discourse, and especially on social media, to me can seem like people essentially looking at the world through shards. Yeah, you, you can actually connect that to T.S. Eliot, heap of broken images, this total fragmentation after the First World War, including fragmentation of moral discourse. And so people, one set, you know, some people look through at that world through a yellow shard and they will go, oh, the world, world is yellow to me. And the next group looks at the world through a blue shard and says, well, to me, it's blue. And the argument that I would make is more, it's more like a stained glass window. So it has yellow, it has blue, and it's a process of putting that together. And that is a richer and more, uh, more nuanced moral discourse. There are a couple of other points in there that you can put these things together in different ways, but it's precisely that process of putting together that I think is also a kind of participation in moral inquiry and participation in citizenship. And, and in a kind of, um, uh, yeah, listening to each other. But for that, you also have to listen to the, I said, or listening is the wrong metaphor now because I'm using a, a kind of hearing as, as the thing, but seeing that there's yellow also yeah, and potentially rearranging that in various ways. So I think that's, you know, you could see negatively that it shifts over time. I think that's exactly positive that that's, that's what we should have in debates. Um, and that we often, I would say, we order the debates better, that, but there are also examples of actually being able to solve them. And so that relates to your vagueness point of view. Uh, partially, if you do genealogy, you're kind of tempted to really look at a lot of negative cases and, 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 and go, here's where uh, memorialization is dysfunctional. And that's true. There are a lot of dysfunctional cases, but one thing that we're trying, that I'm trying to do in the book, but also in other cases, to point out, actually, there are a lot of cases where the ways that people um, end up commemorating are, in various ways, are actually rather good. They're rather successful. And we should pay attention to that because we have to have a language of excellence so that other people can do that also in their own communities. And whether everyone's going to be uh, you know, agreeing that a particular way of commemorializing one article that I've uh, 
that I've written is about the German writer W. G. Sebald, who's a lot, who's a commemorator. Yeah, he talks about the sense of loss and about the displacement and about the crimes that were Nazi crimes. How do you commemorate the commemorator? And I actually make the argument: it's with its fragmentation, it's it's in its or with its kind of gaps, it's even quite. Quite successful. So I think with that, by highlighting positive cases, you can transcend the, the sense that it necessarily has to be vague. Um, and whether people agree or don't agree, that's, again, I think that's part of what we want to do. And that brings me lastly to the scope. There's absolutely cases where people will disagree about what the scope is. And um, but I think you know when it gets when it gets strongly mobilized in political contests uh, contexts, and you have that all across. I, I cannot speak to the case of South Africa. I've looked a little bit at some of the British debates, you know, visiting Bristol and seeing the Colston statue there, or the, the the lack of the Colston statue. But when it's clearly political, then I think it's the level then then that scrutiny that what what. Um, what Michael Walzer said about the just war theory, that it's a, it's a framework for constant scrutiny and imminent critique. Yeah, this is what I think this kind of framework can offer. Plus, and that's really important, that if you order these debates, I think you can sometimes show that there is a synthesis, a synthesis that's possible, like a di dialectical Hegelian I hope I don't throw too many words here at people, but dialectical Hegelian Aufhebung, a kind of resolution in which you actually keep the different claims, but you you actually lift public debate onto another level. And I think there are clear examples of positive resolutions also. So I want to give an argument in favor of the vagueness. So I agree with Jason that your framework is vague. Um, and creates a fair amount of con con confusion about what you ought to do. And I think that might be a virtue. So the analytic philosopher is going to say, here's my very easy to understand framework. Um, you can take this statue down or you should erect this kind of statue and we're going to get lots of yes and no answers. What you're encouraging is this other nuanced conversation, which you know incorporates things like uh, uh, an unfathomability about it and what that might do, which is why I want to say this is a praiseworthy thing, um, is encourage things to stick around. So often what happens is that there's a heated moment in history where people just get so upset that they go and take down a statue of Rhodes, or they take down a statue of Colston, and they throw it in the river, or they hoist it up on a crane. And if you ask them if they would do that in five years' time, they wouldn't. Um, there's just this sort of particular moment in history that charges people to do that. And so all the vagueness, all of the encouragement to have a complicated conversation with lots of strange terms, and that sort of confuddles everybody. And they go, I'm actually not quite sure. And now that I think about it, is this a good idea? And let's look at the historical stuff. And you know, and then the mood lifts, and the thing gets to stick around. Um, and so that might be a very useful political framework to get to you know keep various things up. Um, if what you mean is, I want to come up with a really good set of criteria to work out what kind of statues we erect, which ones we take down, then I have to say, you know, it's going to be very unclear. Uh, but if the idea is that it's a very useful way of preserving a status quo, then I applaud it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, A, I think that one thing that's really important is, I think, to to step outside the, the context that you're immediately comfortable with and look at others. And that's why, you know, me speaking from the Caucasus, Georgia is the place where Josef, Josef Stalin was born. Armenia has suffered terrible genocide uh, in 1915. And so uh, it can be quite refreshing. And the Irish debate, and refreshing sounds trite. I mean, these are these are really, uh, uh, have been traumatic experiences, but they, they can reconfigure a little bit how you look at that. And I mean, the argument that I've made, for example, in the case of Georgia and how to deal with the still a very hagiographic laudatory museum in Gori and his birth town is, to kind of reframe the debate that goes on there. And rather than go to the people of Gori, which is a kind of, you know, a, a town that doesn't have much else that speaks for it, so to speak, and and, uh, and t tell them, okay, now you need to shut down your museum, which uh, the Polish ambassador, for example, has demanded, is to say, okay, well, let's reframe what the museum does and uh, think about enriching the kinds of conversations that happen in these places, and then that you, you that in the end you 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 add to that. And uh, 
there are various other examples that you can mention. I mean, there's one in, uh, that I mentioned in the book, uh, the street name discussion in Tübingen. Tübingen is a very important town in Germany. It's where Hegel uh, and lots of other key people were studying. And there was still a handful of street names where on closer inspection, you could actually find that there were people that had shadows. It wasn't after, there, there are no street names to full on Nazis in Germany anymore, but there were some shadows where maybe an 80 year old writer, one particular case, female writer in her 80s receives some medal from the Fuhrer and writes a laudatory letter, even though she prior to that had been in favor of peace with France, et cetera. So you, but it overshadows her life work. So what did the mayor do? The mayor himself, a bit of a controversial figure, I think did exactly what I think is right. And yes, there is res residual vagueness there, but did the right thing. He went to students, to the next generation and said, you, you people come up, you know, see whether you can come up with an idea for this. And we're all used to these, you know, a four sheets of paper under street signs that give a detailed explanation about someone's past. And instead, what the students came up with, this is a 21-year-old student, Milena Schwer, a 20, you know, not even graduating, came up with the idea of kind of putting a sheath over uh, the, the pole and so that it looks like in that metal pole, there's a knot in it. And so it's visually jarring. And then there is a QR code, but there's something visually jarring about metal with a knot in it. And so then you can actually, there's a contextualization, but it does something new with art. And this is also one of the, the pleas, so to speak, with a fun fact, or pleas is maybe too strong, but one of the points that we're trying to make, have confidence also in the art. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I haven't put that in there, but I've said this elsewhere. I'm not such a great fan, for example, with a Sackler, I know I'm jumping around with lots of issues, but the Sackler um, family had endowed various uh, uh, artistic uh, the wings, I think, in, in New York, for example, um, uh, in the museum. And my reaction, rather than taking the name out, I would say the, the art should confront that combination that it's that it's linked up with power, that it's linked up sometimes with violence, and have the faith in art to also deal with a Sackler name rather than scraping the name off. Again, there, there's going to be context where that's going to be very hard to bear, and I think that needs to be locally negotiated, but, but highlighting that there are really interesting cases where in the end there's enrichment, I think that's important because it, it also shows that it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, so to speak. So I, I do see the um, the value in pres preservation as sort of a default and that highlighting the complexity of the debate will make people le lean towards preservation and lean towards enriching debate rather than just having a simplistic worldview by only having statues that portray the very same thing. And I do see value in that. But there is a risk, I'm guessing, uh, that your account will be overly inclusive in what it thinks should be built or what should stick around. I'm going to assume that there's at least some cases that are clear of statues that shouldn't be put up or statues that should be taken down. I'm going to assume there's at least one case, right? And we can construct it, okay? Uh, we can construct the case. So I was thinking, um, for example, that all of a sudden Osama bin Laden has gained some cachet among uh, the online community. All of a sudden, he wrote some uh, terrifically anti-Semitic uh, pieces, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of people who are paying attention to this and saying this is a good idea, which it clearly isn't. Um, and I was wondering, suppose someone proposed to you, let's put up a statue of Osama bin Laden. Um, if you were to say, well, it's a very complex discussion, we need to really consider all the factors, and in the end, you'd say, well, I mean, there's no conclusive reason not to put it up. And I think, you know, if Osama bin Laden's not a divisive enough figure, we could choose another one. Um, but the point is, I, I don't think there's any figure where you would give a categorical answer because of this vagueness problem. You would say, definitely not. You would say it if it was just very similar to everything else that's around, right? So you'd say, well, that's just a repetition of everything else. But I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of case. I'm talking about the kind of case where there's an evil figure, like a truly ev evil figure, um, 
I, I think that because your account introduces so much vagueness, you have a risk of allowing those cases to, to succeed. Um, so I think the vagueness is if you potentially stick just with the first four criterion of the, the, the use at Bellum, and you have that less when you talk about exiting circular narratives. Uh, when you talk about transforming the collective, and also one of the things that that I would highlight, asserting moral autonomy, I haven't really spoken about that. So that uh, as a particular criterion, and so if you have figures whose clear reference point is that they uh, that they were figures that um, that inflicted violence on others, then you know you can do an account where you say, well. Yes, I, I can give a cogent explanation why some people would put up a statue to to this particular person. Can I ethically really, is that going to be a plausible uh, explanation of having someone in a uniform uh, or, you know, essentially subjugating others? No, they're, 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 it just isn't really there. Uh, so I don't think that's, that's entirely, uh, it, it, it's not that vague under these circumstances. Does it finally, does a framework like that does it finally resolve everything? No, it doesn't. Yeah, and this is why I think it's it, the, the 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 reference to the just war theory is really a good one because you can abuse the just war theory to really argue things uh, in, in 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 strong extremes. So the way that I would put it, and this may be a bit too nuanced in in some ways in in, in order to pitch it to people, but the way that I would put it, it's I would say it's a very strong positive claim that a framework like this ethics of political commemoration is a sensible framework to have, so to speak, in the middle, yeah, between two extreme positions, between the pacifism, you should never really mobilize, and on the other hand, the ends justifies the means, a uh, kind of revolutionary, or if you will, also realpolitik perspective that says, you know, screw all restraint, uh, we'll toss that overboard. And so I think, again, it's a positive claim about there is sensibly a paradigm there that allows us to order debates. But can I really convince you and make it a binding claim that you should should not be pacifist because you just say, I abhor um, kind of contesting things and trying to compel others? Or can I really sensibly say to you, if you've been a traumatized individual, that you, that you should actually now kind of be on your best behavior? And we've had that charge. I've had that charge leveled against me of kind of, uh, you know, being patronizing, lecturing, paternalist, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those are charges I take seriously. I still think this kind of middle course to me is personally attractive. Um, but, but again, I think that's why that, that parallel is so useful because it highlights both the strengths and some of the, lim the limitations of any such ethical framework. So I'm going to try and pin you down. Um, mm. So we're deciding whether we're going to put up a statue of Osama. Okay. By the way, what Jason has said isn't totally detached from reality. So there was a very recent trend of a whole bunch of young Americans saying, oh my goodness, I've read uh, Osama bin Laden's letter to America and it's just changed my mind. And I realized that the Americans were the bad guys. And even though I celebrated his death when Obama killed him, I realized I was wrong. Um, and they read out various sections of this letter, which he, he wrote after um, one of Osama's uh, terror attacks. Um, and so you can imagine that you say, okay, well, we've got certain criteria we've got to use, so let's make it a bit unfathomable. The statute, it must exit the circular narrative. Uh, just war theory must play a role. So there aren't many statues of Osama bin Laden in America, I imagine. So let's assume we're going to erect one in Portland. And uh, we've got... Uh, I don't know, Osama sitting on the clouds with the 72 virgins, so it all looks very peaceful. And, you know, there's some inscription from the letter to America underneath there. Um, and it talks about, you know, pushing back against imperialism. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a circular narrative to me. Um, it looks quite peaceful. The claim, of course, is that they were involved in a just war where they were toppling the, uh, you know, awful imperialists in America. And so, you know, the city of Portland is now voting as to, are we going to put this thing up? Um, and the people, you know, who've, just been hanging out on TikTok, say, yeah, let's do it. I mean, this guy's a hero. He's a wonderful figure. Um, and then the people in New York are not so happy. You know, they sort of remember 9-11 uh, pretty vividly. And, um, you know, they, they have family members who were, were killed by this uh, moral monster. How does your system tell us what we ought to do? Um, 
so yeah, it's a very good challenge, and the and and again, emphasis on conversation. So the first version that I'm going to give you here is not is not the best version that that that, that I would come up with over time. I think this would, you know, a just cause is a grievous wrong that you have suffered that has fundamentally displaced you. So I struggle, you know. I would ask what exactly is the just cause of Osama bin Laden here directly? And then the que next question is, what's the good intention? Now, if someone says, would say, well, we need to think about all the suffering that, uh, that you know, the West has imposed, then I could say, okay, well, you know, that's an interesting intention. I don't entirely see how that's linked to Osama bin Laden, if I'm being polite. I could, all, of course, respond more polemically. And then I say exiting circular narrative. So you say one kind of violence is going to be replaced by another kind of violence. So I think that's actually, to me, is a repet repetition of a circular narrative. So in that way, I would find, you know, I, I would try to be respectful I guess, if I argued with people, and I, I have to be that because I am in, in the zone environment from which I'm speaking to you, Georgia, I am I'm, I have these debates with people all the time, where I think demonstrating that at least, I, for example, understand where anger comes from. And I mean, very angry attacks on me or on colleagues by people who are descendants of survivors of the Armenian genocide. And I understand that when I talk about, well, maybe this form of commemoration in Armenia maybe you're not so entirely convinced with that that they think it's intrusive and i think that's that's on us so to speak also to to listen to that you know it doesn't doesn't mean that it doesn't annoy me sometimes when when you get uh, when when people challenge you but so you know on these things i would find it i think i'd find it easy to respond then you have an interesting case if i can take it to a real case where there's an ongoing debate like Karl luger the I, i'm not even entirely sure i pronounce the name correctly myself but the former mayor the, the mayor of vienna who was clearly uh, com a committed anti-semitic mayor uh, and there's still a, i would say still uh, german sensibilities i guess are a bit more heightened there than Austrian ones, but there are there is a statue to him in central Vienna and, and an interesting debate of actually putting that statue at an angle, a little off kilter with a seven degree kind of, so that it's not a straight statue anymore. I would think at the very least, something like that should be in there so that you can, yes, you can look at the statue. Yes, there's some recognition for what he did in fashioning Vienna as a kind of modern city, but that without any context, I, I would find difficult, uh, I, I, I struggle with, to be honest. So I think there are responses in extreme cases, but again, I, I also really emphasize that I think uh, precisely it's upon us and I, the, the boring middle, if you will, because I would describe it myself as that, but as the middle to to try and have a good debate and to listen. I think that's a very interesting answer, uh, the idea of putting the statue at seven degrees. Um, I think that's fascinating because often the debate is framed as do you tear it down or do you keep it up? Um, and I quite like the solution of, as you say, a middle ground. Um, you can still look at the statue, it's still there in its original form, but uh, some, some sort of representation of uh, ambivalence towards it is built in now. Um, some critique is thrown into the very structure. Um, I think that's very smart. There's a great example. If any of your listeners are in Berlin, you should look at the German Ministry of Finance. It was a building built by Goering, the guy who, you know, next to all the other German crimes, sometimes not in people's uh, kind of center of focus, who had, was integral to starting the, the terrible air war in Europe. And so it's a clearly fascist building. But it's also an interesting architectural building. And the, the, when the East Germans took over, uh, had to build up a government, they had to use the, the building because it was one of the buildings that was intact. It also has Bauhaus elements. So, I mean, you know, that, that fascism had all of this. And then the question was, after reunification, what do we do with the building? And so typically Germany sometimes has small country syndrome. Yeah? So they, they got an American professors in who said, you have to tear it down. This is just too much with Goering and the Luftwaffe. There's too much baggage. But it, I think it's a great example of legitimate authority. So there was one artist who said, in a public discussion said, this building struck him like a bus that had had various passengers and various stops. And maybe that shouldn't yet be, uh, you know, maybe there's still a future for this kind of vessel, so to speak. 
And so in that process, they thought of a, a layering it and they have the socialist mural that glorifies socialism. That was the socialist version of exercising the, the Nazi ghost. They left that there and had yet another layer of art and then renamed the building for a victim of left-wing terrorism and the biggest room in the building for a victim, victim of right-wing terrorism. And so it was more than a single story. And I think one of the reasons, that's my hunch, one of the reasons why they got it right is because they took time to debate and maybe because it was actually not so much just classical art or culture people involved, but also the Ministry of Finance. And it's a really fascinating place because it challenges citizens to find their own positions from which they want to look. What, what do they want to see? The mural up close or the something that recalls the victims of socialism? And I think we need, ethics also needs to give an account as a set of excellence. I mean, this is something that Alistair McIntyre talks about, but it's really important because, because without an understanding of excellence and just talking about negative deviance, we don't actually have very good societal debates. I wondered what your thoughts were about the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So what you have is a series of pillars at different heights. Um, and the idea is that it's an interactive space. So people will go in there and they'll often lose sight of each other. And it can create this feeling of isolation, of loss, as your child runs around and you, you lose track of them. Um, there's something... Uh, not obvious about it when you first see it. It's not obvious to people what it is commemorating, uh, but it's meant to create an experience uh, that has some relationship with the kind of isolation that Jews felt or the, the idea of you know your children being taken away from you by the Nazis. There's these interesting things. And so the unfathomability of it seems like one of those positive components. And I wonder if you think it's a successful piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you raise that because unfathomability, I think, is exactly right. And losing losing the people that you're with because you, you cannot walk abreast and then finding them again and then being there, but also walking out of it again uh, in that. So I think it's it's almost, and there it, this is one of several memorials in Berlin where like the memorial for the burned books, that's not actually outside, but it's, you kind of look into a chamber underground and, and at, only properly see it at night. The one uh, thing that I cite where a young British man asked me while we were standing in there and thinking about this, and he said, he asked this really interesting question, which I didn't have an answer to at all. He said, is there any plan for when this might, you know, be de when, when maybe this will also vanish over time? So, but I think it's, I thought this is a, a classic way of really illustrating contained unfathomability, and I show it. Uh, show it in presentations. There's one thing that struck me with the German debate and that we I talked about recently in Berlin, that maybe one thing we should have in order to, to, to exactly transform the collective should maybe have in all memorials, and this is a tentative thought, maybe this is really a bad idea, but is that there should be an, an, an addendum, so to speak, and to all others who suffered terribly. The point being is there are, for example, migrants who come to Germany who may have had terrible histories of suffering in Somalia or in, you know, in Syria and other places. And then the question for them is, you know, where am I? And specifically in Germany, this has been highlighted, where the strong identification of memorials with certain victim groups then were a challenge for Sinti and Roma, who felt, well, what about us, so to speak? And that if victim memorials had a very strong emphasis on inclusion, not to say this is generalized for everybody on the planet, but also to say, and there is something else in there that maybe in retrospect, this might have been a, a widening of it that would have opened the collective there and 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 that sense that again Cynthia and Roma is one example, but of course there are a range of victims there. I don't feel very, very strongly about that. It's just something that I because I want to be respectful of the particular groups of victims that are commemorated there. And and a lot of the debate often is kind of trying to challenge and take something away. It's just a point of reflection. And I think the framework again lends itself to reflecting in that way. So my question is for Mark, what do you think about this altering of statues and of, of commemor commemorable um, 
phenomena. So I, I think you're you're very much a pro. Um, you you believe that these statues should be preserved under almost all cases. Um, what do you think about taking a statue, moving it seven degrees to one side, you know, tilting it, uh, changing the names of rooms in the building, um, altering the 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 um, the the writing that's under the Holocaust Museum? Like, how do you, how do you feel about changing? In a bit. Yeah, there's some some value in it, and I suppose you're dealing with things that are part of the public. Uh, they're often in public spaces, and we think about how our spaces generally change. If you look at a city over fifty years, you know there's it, it has evolved in many ways, and I think our relationship with some of those figures is going to evolve. I generally have preservationist tendencies, so. I don't like the idea of destroying things. I think it's important to be able to preserve them for various reasons. So sometimes to remember the horrors of the past, it's important to see who was venerated before. It doesn't mean you have to keep them in the public square. It doesn't mean that because you had a you know a big statue of Stalin, um, you know in Eastern Bloc countries that it needs to remain where it was. Um, but there might be some value in having a, a grave of uh, these Soviet leaders that people can go and visit and find out about. Um, there are interesting cases, of course, in Germany where the idea was to destroy them so that they wouldn't become sites for uh, neo-Nazis. Um, so uh, I remember going to visit the site of Hitler's bunker, and basically um, it's a suburban neighborhood, um, and there's just a sewer grate that you can kind of look down, and you know, tour guides will tell you this is where the bunker was, and that there's no sign anywhere uh, implying it. Um, and there is something about that, you know, this idea of, if we kept these symbols in place, there could be a resurgence of this evil idea. Um, and maybe it's a bit superstitious to think something like that. Um, I think sometimes making fun of someone is quite a good method. So um, tilting it by seven degrees, you know, shows a certain level of play um, and that, you know, you don't take this person too seriously and I would approve of something like that. Um, when I was at University of Cape Town, um, Rhodes was seen in, different ways by different people. Um, Afrikaners aren't particularly wild about roads because um, there's involvement in the Jamison raid. And so often um, students who lived right next door to the statue would um, put luau flowers around him or put a, a beer in his hand and you know things like that. And that I also find unobjectionable. You're interacting with it but preserving it. Um, but I did find it horrifying to remove it. Um, because the problem is once you start removing one thing, you've created a precedent for the removal of others. And so very soon after that statue came down, um, works of art were, were burnt publicly um, uh, at, UC, at UCT. Many others were um, put into hiding on the grounds of you know, to preserve them, but never to return. Um, and so I think we should be very wary um, about destruction. But I think engaging in that playful style uh, can be quite productive. Um, and you know, you might unearth further things about that person and, uh, you know, how you make fun of them or how you venerate them might shift, but you don't have the worry about, uh, you know, the deliberate permanent destruction. Hans, I wonder about, you sort of talked about the idea of looking at these other successful uh, memorials. Um, and it seems like aesthetic considerations could play a role. What do you think those um, ought to be? Um, the aesthetic considerations, I think that that would be in the kind of use, uh, use in memoria kind of category that, that there is a, an, an encounter there that, that contributes to a very deep reflection. So it's not just uh, a pure, I find this particularly beautiful, but that you actually start reflecting on your particular, uh, on your own contingency. And one again, one example that I cite, this is very detailed, but there was an exhibition in Berlin on, on Heinrich Schliemann, the person that had found Troy, so to speak, uh, when it had gotten lost. And they attributed a quote to somebody, they couldn't actually source it, but they said, you know, the real destroyer of Troy was not the uh, Danaeans, the Greeks, but it was Heinrich Schliemann himself. So that feeds exactly into the kind of uh, making the person in the exhibition kind of feel smugly good about themselves, what that I've... 
found, I have to say, I found very grating because, and the appropriate response, that's not now, not now aesthetic, but the appropriate better quote, since this one was unattributed, would have been, Schliemann destroyed a lot in the context of excavating Troy, but today when we excavate, we also destroy a lot. Yeah, so you so you acknowledge the loss, but you also talk about the contingency so that you see the individual sees themselves and starts thinking, oh, well, you know, that that where am I in this particular context? And great art is a reframing. Yeah, there is a great art is an re-encounter, often a re-articulation. Uh, Richard Rorty talked about strong poets. I mean, he had taken that from some other writers, but a kind of finding a new vocabulary. And so that that I do think is is what some of the best of that does. And it's not it's not just contingent along the lines. Okay, let's not ever do this to this particular group of people again. But rather, how do I think of myself individually? And I should also say, for me, this kind of engagement is not just about statues. Yeah, so, so I mean, this may be a bit of a jump from where we you started off from. But one of the reasons why I do go on Wikipedia and edit Wikipedia and add to Wikipedia, because I do think it's a way of, of finding a relationship to things that are, that are a threat of getting, not necessarily a threat, but that might get lost other, otherwise. So I do think it's really, really important to me that this isn't just about some generalized idea about, oh, I wish all politicians would do X, Y, Z, but that as an ethical practice, I think the question gets back to you as an individual to reflect what does that mean for what you're actually going to do on a day-to-day -day level. And of course, you could always do more or maybe could do it even better. But I do think that with that, it's it's actually something that gives me a degree of optimism uh, about and, and possibility about ethics, you know, that this is, isn't just a framework that you slap others with, but that you kind of expands your sense of what's possible.